You know, the notion of it can't happen here uh, is no longer a notion. How can anyone learn in an environment where they are afraid? No more silence! These are our lives at stake. Those threats have doubled since Parkland. We're seeing so much anxiety about coming to school. We all know that in order for learning to occur, we have to have safe schools. Where are the possible solutions? With the program we have in place, is something like that is virtually impossible. There's no way to get into these doors. There is no one-size-fits-all. It's not cheap. Our app is really unique. Yeah, if anybody can fix this issue, I would trust the people of Utah to do that. Good evening. We're going to have your headlines and weather coming up shortly. But first tonight, we want to go in depth on a topic that is urgent, important, and affects nearly every family in Utah. In fact, so urgent that right now the Canyon School District is investigating a possible threat against Indian Hills Middle School, and they need your help in their effort to keep kids safe. Welcome back. Throughout the day here on KSL, we are going to be talking about a resource here in Utah to help protect your kids, to keep them safe, give them an avenue where they can reach out for help if they need it. It is called the Safe Utah app. From your smartphone, you can instantly chat or call a licensed crisis counselor, and you can talk about issues ranging from bullying to suicide, or if you feel like there is uh, something that a threatening you're feeling threatened you can you can reach out and send a tip to your school the resource is available 24 hours a day seven days a week so we sent out a survey to thousands of high school teachers across the state to ask about school safety and you received an overwhelming response yeah a survey of this kind on school security is unprecedented in utah we had nearly 1500 teachers respond to our exclusive ksl survey so safety clearly is a concern Teachers we surveyed all agreed their job involves more than educating our teenagers. Our physical safety is something that we as teachers and the students definitely think about. We ask specifically high school you know teachers statewide I'm how they feel about safety. Do they have the training they need? Are schools making changes? Within days, we had 1,433 teachers eager to share their concerns. Teachers like Rachel Bradshaw, who told us she doesn't always feel safe at school or in her class. Because of things that happen uh, nowadays in schools that didn't used to happen. Fortunately, she's in the minority. According to our anonymous KSL survey, 90% of teachers, the vast majority, do feel safe at school. But many shared the sentiment in their comments that they also feel a heavy responsibility. The thought of having 30 students looking to me and me being the one responsible for their safety is extremely overwhelming. We here at KSL are committed to helping you to protect your family. And as Kathy Barber said, there is a lot about suicide prevention that is hard. This is the easy part. Here's the gun lock right here. Tomorrow, we will be fanning out across the state from Ogden to St. George, giving away these gun locks free. New specialist Jed Bull shares success stories that highlight why it's so important for us to download this critical tool right now. We think this app should be on the phone of every student, parent, and teacher in this state. Utah's economy keeps chugging along at a record pace, and that means more people are working and more children are in daycare. Parents are quickly discovering that they are paying more too, Mike. Yeah, and that is adding to the financial squeeze, making for an unaffordable Utah. You may have noticed it's a lot more expensive to rent around Salt Lake City. A lot of folks are moving here, and that's pushing prices up. We're talking about hundreds of dollars in fees just to register at Utah's public schools. Yeah, charging mandatory school fees is causing debate and concern across the state. And it's just one more pocketbook issue that we're tackling in our series of unaffordable Utah reports. Large, unexpected medical bills are becoming more common and they're causing a lot of stress. In tonight's unaffordable Utah report, new specialist Lad Egan shows us how to bargain down those complicated bills. If you take a prescription or know someone who does, you know the cost can be ridiculous. So tonight we continue our unaffordable Utah reports to show you how to save hundreds. Investigative reporter Debbie Dijanovic compared prices at several pharmacies and instead of pulling out her insurance card, she asked for the cash price. As housing prices rise, 
Many worried they're being priced out of the state they love. Job growth is up, unemployment is down, but almost 10 years since the Great Recession, the effects are still being felt in one specific area. We're talking about your paycheck. You probably noticed it isn't increasing like you or even economists expected. We've explored skyrocketing rent, but now we're going to look at rising health care costs. Yeah, Dini, one Utah family considered extreme measures when the insurance company said no to a necessary but costly surgery for their daughter. Your specialist Lad Egan showing us their battle for health care. We don't eat out. We don't go to movies. We don't celebrate birthdays. For the Meredith family, they say they're paying more. For eight years, we've spent half our income on health care. But getting less when it comes to their health care coverage. The deductibles, the copays, I mean, they don't even start paying for stuff until, you know, halfway through the year. Last year alone, the family of five spent $25,000 on insurance premiums and another $20,000 out of pocket. I mean, health care is more than our cars, more than our car insurance, yeah, more than our house, all put together. And then you keep getting bills. And it's Penny like, pinching oh, well, could only get them bad. so far. Well, this is a biggie. How much is this one Especially here? when faced with an insurmountable challenge. $100,000 surgery. You know, what middle class family can come up with $100,000 for a medical procedure? I mean, it's, it's crazy. Their daughter, Marin, needed a cochlear implant. She was completely deaf in her right ear and she's mostly deaf in her left ear. Years of trying to authorize the surgery were useless. Insurance wouldn't cover it, and the clock was ticking. Looking for any way out, they considered something drastic. The rest of their story in a second. First, this isn't an isolated case. Two thirds of US adults say the cost of health care is stressing them out. People are having conversations with their neighbors about premiums just like they are about the weather. Stacy Stanford with the Utah Health Policy Project says the frustrations are mounting. Really the out-of-pocket squeeze, you know, is what hurts people. Well, we know that about 70 million people in the U.S. have high deductible health plans. 41% of us, according to the CDC, now have plans with family deductibles of at least $2,600. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are, it's hard for everybody. Angela Fagerlin at the University of Utah State studied this shift to higher out-of-pocket payments and found only 6% of patients tried to negotiate prices. I think it's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to admit that they can't afford it. She'll be the first to admit even those wanting to be savvy consumers quickly discover cost comparison data is nearly impossible to find. I think that's where we need to start because we can't ask people to be consumers if we don't give them information to do so. Even so, there are steps we can all take right now to save money. Stay in network for everything, including labs and x-rays. Check for errors on doctor bills and insurance explanations. Look for discounts on pricey prescription drugs. Avoid the ER by finding lower cost urgent care like video consultations or a doctor's office with extended hours. And ask questions before undergoing expensive procedures. You can ask why. You can ask if that really should be the first step or second step or whatever. It's been four years we've been fighting for this. Granted, none of that would have helped the Merediths who felt they couldn't win. The state is coming to you and say, we can only help you if we break you first. The happily married couple even planned on breaking up. We had no desire to get divorced. Over half our Splitting up their family to get Medicaid, which would cover the $100,000 cochlear implant. And then we can go and say, look, we don't have a two-income household anymore. Then, around Christmas time, seemingly more bad news. John got let go from his architectural firm. Losing his job, though, turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Without a paycheck, the family finally qualified for Medicaid. Not bad. Ow. Giving Marin the long-awaited gift of hearing. That's pretty cool. Just a neat moment for that family. Marin is still waiting to get her cochlear implant activated. Her family promises to share some of that video with us of that exciting moment. And, you know, we certainly want to give our children everything they need to succeed. Just incredible what that family had to go through to get that one surgery. Absolutely. I mean, there are, like you said, different choices and options that we have now. But... Boy, to have to be faced with those decisions. I know. And most of us, you know, it comes down to smaller things. I know with my family, we can save money by going to like an after hours clinic. That saves us that $75 copay to go to maybe more of like an urgent care or even more if you tried to go to the hospital. Right. Yeah. The right, fact that you have to lose your job, though, to, to get that, that's, uh, that's the kick in the pants right yeah, there. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Thanks Lad.
On April 18th, Roosevelt police were called to investigate an alleged sexting ring involving students at Union High School. Police records obtained by KSL show at least 27 people were reported to be involved, including suspects and victims. That was nearly seven months ago. And as of tonight, there have been zero repercussions. Mike and the KSL investigators went in search of answers to find out why. Yeah, Dave Dini, let's be clear here. In that police report, this case is dealing with allegations of child pornography. A parent says their child felt afraid, harassed, and threatened. One student saying they were badgered into sending nude photos. So, other than taking a police report seven months ago, has anything been done? In a town of roughly 7,000 people, you can bet whatever the story, it travels. Technically, it is a rumor, but... And it travels fast. It was a whole ring. It was the whole school. Everyone was affected, no matter if you were directly involved or not. Cheyenne Spencer is a senior at Union High School, and that ring she's talking about involving her classmates is more than a rumor. It's an investigation now at the highest level of the state. In an eight-page report by Roosevelt Police, it details 18 suspects allegedly involved in this sexting ring and the nine young girls who likely never even knew they were victims. People were just wanting to keep it hidden and keep it underneath the radar. According to police reports, this is how the ring operated. Male students would solicit female students for nude images. Once a pornographic photo or video was sent to one, it was then shared with all who were part of this alleged Snapchat group group police records show in order to be a part of someone must exchange a nude image of a person they know and the details are disturbing girls solicited for nude images and sex sending nude photos receiving nude photos a pornographic video of a teen masturbating then asking the girl to send a pornographic video in return in one case police reports reveal a 17 year old boy confessed to video recording sex acts with a 16 year old girl then posted it on a Snapchat forum for other male members to view. The underage girl says she never consented to the sex acts being filmed and did not consent to the videos being posted for others to view. From the police report, the initial one, 18 people who are involved in this, suspects, so to speak, and nine people who are affected by this were victims. Is that significant to you? What do you mean by victims? That's Stephen Foote, top prosecutor in Duchesne County. And what we mean by victims is a reported one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine underage girls. Some saying they were asked daily, badgered, humiliated, degraded, and reluctantly sending nude photos of themselves to boys. Those were the ones willing to tell their stories to police, something sex it's abuse counselors will tell you sure. is hard yeah. to do. There are a ton of reasons why someone might not want to speak out. I think definitely the core of it is fear of not being believed. And yet six months after the police investigation began and Foote's office still has not prosecuted a single boy. One reason, police never gave them a final report. Are police not doing, are they not doing their job? Are they not getting enough information in the investigation? I don't want to talk bad about police. I think that they, they've tried to do their job at some, some points. At some points, some things have not been done well. Like what? Uh, like originally the phones probably should have been seized upon out initial finding out of the case. There were some that were seized later in the, in the game, but too late to, to find anything on them. In a supplemental report by Roosevelt Police Chief Rick Harrison, it says eventually five phones were taken as evidence. Just five phones from the alleged 2017s involved, which means 80% of the phone evidence was never even looked at. So they didn't have cell phones until you requested them to confiscate cell phones. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, the voice you're hearing is Anthony Wilcox, Foote's deputy attorney working juvenile cases. He says by the time phones were confiscated by police weeks after the initial report, it was too late. The evidence no longer exists, and it'll make it hard to proceed with the case. Wilcox says he told police to further investigate. That was five months ago. And since then, he has seen no more searching for evidence, no more interviewing suspects, and no more testimony from victims. On paper, it appears police have done nothing. And let's be honest here, it is tough to prosecute a case if police never finish the investigation. For months, the KSL investigators tried getting answers from Chief Harrison. 
but he refused to answer calls and refused to return messages. So we traveled 143 miles to Roosevelt, walked into the police station. I'm looking for Chief Harrison. And straight up asked for him. And then we waited. 5, 10, 15, 20, nearly 30 minutes later. And an officer who is not Chief Harrison makes his way out. Why does nobody want to talk to me about this? And informs us that Chief was no longer at the station. Did he leave once we got here? I don't know when he left. Well, fortunately, the 12 surveillance cameras throughout the station know exactly when he left. Just seven minutes after we showed up asking, the Chief can be seen hurrying down the hallway, out the back door into the sally port, and finally driving off in his truck. While the chief appears to be hiding from our questions, the county attorney... Why would you ask that question? Why are you, what are you here for today? Well, he appears to be irritated with our questions, especially the one where we ask... Is there a conflict here? There could be. Turns out, one of those boys not prosecuted... You don't know if there's a conflict of interest in this case. There could be. Just happens to have so very so close that, ties with someone in Foote's office. It was pretty early in the process that our office decided that we would have a conflict. That could be family members, friends, close relatives, something like that? That's correct. That's okay. correct. And while the deputy attorney openly talked about it, if you dare ask his boss... Is there a conflict? We're not going to talk about I don't want names. How about this? I don't want I'm not going to talk about any conflicts. I'm not going to talk about anybody's issues, any parent's child. I'm not talking about any of those things. It's not going to be said. It's not going to be answered. Not going to be answered. And so far, not going to be prosecuted. In a town of roughly 7,000 people, stories travel. It was huge. And they travel fast. And months after KSL started asking questions, the details of this investigation have now been turned over to the state attorney general's office. It does ruin people's lives. But with so little evidence gathered, it's difficult to see a story where the lives of these nine victims will ever get justice. And now that the case is in the hands of the Utah Attorney General's office, they will review all the evidence, which they do not have a lot of, as you saw in the story, and then screen the case for charges. Could be weeks, maybe even months, before these 27 kids know the outcome. There's a business near downtown Salt Lake City that's getting a lot of attention. Attention from customers, attention from neighbors, attention from police. And as Mike and the KSL investigators discovered, the most recent attention is coming because of a city ordinance. Yeah, Dini, the business is called the Gateway Inn. It is a motel on the west side with a history of serious criminal activity. Some in the neighborhood want the business shut down. So, KSL investigators went undercover to see what is going on and why it is not so easy for the city to do anything about it. Take a stroll along the west side of North Temple and there's an old motel that's occupied this spot for decades. No glitz, no glamour, no luxury suites. For 60 bucks a night, this is what you might encounter at the Gateway Inn. Anywhere between prostitution, drug sales, we've had homicides. Salt Lake City PD records for 2017 obtained by the KSL investigators show police responding to allegations of rape, drugs, theft, a stabbing, shots fired, assault with a gun, assault with a knife, and the list goes on. I mean, most people, they might seem like they're doing wrong, but they're just trying to survive out here. That's know? Klaus. He tells KSL he's a recovering addict, just one of dozens loitering in front of the gateway. While he does not live in the yes. neighborhood... I live in the area. I just live a couple blocks away. Like some people like, like Nigel that. Swaby do. He's with the area, Chamber of Commerce. But ultimately, we want the, the motel closed down. Claiming the Gateway Inn does nothing more than attract crime hurting nearby businesses and putting lots of people on edge. It hasn't been a priority. Drove down here the other day, and hopefully now it gets to be a priority. Somebody on the street. I would love for the city to do more. The city to do more. All right, well, first, let's see what the city has already done. Over the last couple of years, the health department has shut down room after room after room for health and safety violations. KSL investigators confirming exactly what the health department documented. There's a lot of splashes, you know, and, and smearing. After renting a couple of rooms... It reminds me of a third world country. When I first came here and we flipped the light on... And hiring our own certified home and health inspectors to go undercover. It's a roach. 
It's a roach. Max Gillenskog and Jonathan Brockbank found some very serious problems. There's a large oh, one. Oh, wow, that one's big. Here's another. Here's one that's moving on the wall. One, two, three, four, five. Five live ones we've got in there. Beyond the ick factor is the safety issue. We ran a meth test also matching the health department, finding high levels of the illicit drug in both rooms. There's one up there. There's oh, one well, in the I would recommend that this be closed off and, uh, and sprayed. Oh. Peekaboo. Step outside the rooms, and Salt Lake Police have been called out to the Gateway Inn nearly 1,100 times, investigating more than 300 cases, making 132 arrests. All of that in one year, in one location. In fact, every month, the Gateway Inn makes a top 10 for police services. One officer spending an average of two hours per call at a wage of $48 on average with benefits equals a cost to taxpayers of more than $111,000 each year in just calls to the Gateway Inn alone. Uh, that is a lot of calls. That's uh, averaging over a couple uh, incidents per day at a location. Detective Greg Wilkins that says between the health and police departments, this place should not be an operating business. Do you not have the evidence right now to be able to shut down a business like this? I would say we do have the evidence. All right, so if the evidence is right there, why is the Gateway still open? Police were hopeful city ordinance 588040 would solve the problem. It was created a year and a half ago to take immediate action on business activity with the potential of revoking a business license. So the KSL investigators dug into city records and found out the ordinance has been used 366 times against Salt Lake businesses. How many times it has been used against the Gateway Inn? Zero. So in your opinion, is this ordinance even worth anything right now? I was hoping that it would be worth more than it has been. We have not used this on hotels or motels. Um, How come? Because it's difficult. That's Salt Lake City CFO Mary Beth Thompson, not Mayor Biskupski, who could not accommodate an interview with KSL. Thompson says it's difficult because... Those crimes are not tied to the business owner, and I can't shut the business down without them being tied to the business owner. So if the owner's got a clean slate... Does that make sense? He can keep collecting money no matter how suspicious the client may be. Personally, no, probably doesn't make sense. Um, but that's the way the ordinances are written. That's the way the, the statutes are written. And that's the way... Go home. State. Don't come anymore to my property. Jesse Singh is allowed to run his business. He's owned the Gateway Inn for three and a half years now and will say things like... I do my very, very best here to keep my property. I'm very, 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 very frustrating here. We, if we know people that's dr like druggy people, they're selling drugs, we never rent the room. Never, ever. Yeah. But the reality is, whatever he says he is doing to keep criminal activity off his property is not working. And Singh wants police, the community, and the city to know. I don't say to people, hey, come to my hotel and bring the roaches and sell the meth. It's not his fault. So what's the answer? I don't know. Tell me answers. You tell me what to do. All right, Jesse, since you brought it up, documents show the city gave you a list of things to do months ago to make your property safer. Things like better surveillance out the front windows and better access control to stop criminals from coming onto the property. When KSL investigators visited eight months later, we saw windows still blocked by gambling machines and unrestricted access to parking. The only change we could find was the water to an outdoor faucet had been turned off to deter loitering. The city also shows you are no show to meetings with the mayor's staff, council members, and a community council hoping to solve the problems on your property. Instead, the song remains the same. But here's something you should know. Two days after our interview with the city, they are taking action. Right now, the new city ordinance, 588040, cannot be used. So they sent this letter to the Gateway Inn just days ago using state code 78B6-1101 and 1107. In short, it's a nuisance law, which means if they don't clean up the illegal activities and health code violations in a reasonable time, it could lead to criminal charges. And hey, guess what? If there was a criminal charge that they were convicted of, the business owner was convicted of, I could shut it down. The previously unusable code 588040 could finally be used. While that's not the goal, it may be the only answer. In all, the mayor's office says the Gateway Inn has 23 specific actions that need to be addressed in the next 60 days. If the Gateway fails to do so, the city says that is when they can begin taking legal action, possibly leading to the business being shut down. It is unconstitutional, illegal, inappropriate, 
and in my opinion, un-American. When a Utah woman was pulled over for not having insurance, she was surprised. Surprised because she does have insurance. The KSL investigators then uncovered tens of thousands of Utahns are at risk for having the same thing happen to them. Dave, because of our reporting, a debate is now brewing on how police are using the insurance database. Some saying it could be a violation of your civil rights. KSL investigator Debbie Dejanovic shows you why this could happen to you. It's a sinking feeling seeing a cop car with its lights on behind you. Right when the light turned green, that's when the red and blue started shining. This is police car video of an officer following Kelly Shido, pulling her over into a parking lot and blocking her car in while she was on her way to breakfast one Sunday. My name is Officer Mahoski. I'm with North Salt Lake Police. You weren't speeding. Yeah. You didn't run a red light. I was just sitting at a stoplight. <laughs> reason I stopped you today is I show your vehicle doesn't have insurance. Shido it says it does. It definitely does. The officer okay. says it doesn't. It's just when I ran your plate, it's showing that in our state system that there's no insurance. Did you have insurance? I did, yeah, absolutely. Did you have proof of it there? I didn't in my car because um, I had just used it and forgot to put it back in my car. <laughs> Without an insurance card on hand to prove it. And they said that this vehicle is not on the policy. Shido? Got a um, ticket. I'm going to issue a citation today for driving without insurance. So I'll just have you sign that copy there for me. After we heard Shido's story, we looked deeper. And it turns out there are about 56,000 drivers in Utah who may end up just like her. Which means if you're one of the unlucky ones, police could pull you over and tell you to prove you have insurance. A company named InsureRight operates the database police use. The audit shows that we are over 96% accurate. CEO Richard Casteller says repeated state audits show of all the policies fed into the database, there's a margin of error that is under 5%. In that matching process, you're going to have some mistakes when you have, you know, a couple of billion records and a, a 300 different insurance companies. Mistakes? An insurance company doesn't report your new policy right away. A clerical error in your VIN number. And in Shido's case, you happen to have an insurance policy from another state. Insurance companies outside of Utah aren't required to report to the database. So police run your license plate. Your car pops up. Your vehicle doesn't have insurance. Uninsured. Its legality may be for a court to decide. Its effectiveness, you decide. The KSL investigators reviewed three years' worth of traffic stops from across Utah and found almost 12,000 tickets issued for no insurance. West Valley City Police used it the most, issuing 568 tickets. And our research shows 150 of those drivers actually did have insurance and proved it in court. You cannot be stopped by a policeman just to check and see if you're violating the law. Defense attorney and former prosecutor Kent Morgan. So do you think it's a violation of our Fourth Amendment rights? Yes, I do, and so does the Supreme Court of the United States. And he well, says police should not be using this database at all as a reason to stop you. He argues officers need to first spot you breaking the law, speeding, maybe running a red light. He's getting cases thrown out of court with that argument. Policemen need to be educated on what's an appropriate reason to pull somebody over. We do it to protect the motorists of the state of Utah. Motor Vehicle Enforcement Director Alan Shinney defended officers' use of the database. Other officers we spoke to by phone insisted it is not a violation of your civil rights because the law says we have to have car insurance. Especially if you're a single mother or a college student where you just have liability and then you go and get in a wreck with someone that has no insurance and then you have nothing. And that's happened to three of my family members. It's pretty painful. But don't wait longer than 14 or else it does turn into a warrant. Now, if you end up like Kelly Shido and can't provide proof on the spot, officers, well, they can impound your car, which will cost you a couple hundred bucks. So legally, I cannot let you drive away without insurance. However, we are in a parking lot. It is private. I'm not going to sit here and watch you. In her case, the officer cut her a break. She did not get towed. Call someone, do what you need to do, but... She fought it in court, proved she was insured all along and got the ticket dismissed. Thanks, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, how do you fight the ticket on the spot? Carry your insurance card, either on your phone or in your glove box. The database company sends out letters to warn people they're showing up as uninsured, and they told us they did send one to Kelly. She says she never got one, likely because of several moves. If you do get one, Mike, do not ignore it. This will affect a lot of people, and uh, you know, a lot of people change insurance companies quite often. Is there a way to check? 
Yes, but the onus is on you, me, and everyone else. Once we brought the concerns to the database company, they said, go ahead and give them a call. They will actually see if you're labeled as insured on the database. And we've put more information on how to do that at ksltv.com. Right, great story as usual. Debbie, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Tonight on KSL, the beauty of Pyeongchang. Our Olympic crews taking in the sights outside of the competitions. Plus, a wild day of weather, soon to be weekend of weather. Kevin's in the snow coat with the next storm moving in. But first, a deadly plane crash in eastern Utah. We're tracking the developing news. KSL News starts now. Good evening. Tonight, sheriff's investigators say four people are dead after a plane crashed in eastern Utah. That plane reportedly on its way to New Mexico. The wreckage was found this afternoon in the eastern part of San Juan County near the border of Colorado. the past three weeks, the KSL team has called South Korea home, covering the games and following our Utah Olympians. Mike Hedrick got a chance to break away from the competition to soak in some of the beauty of the country, and he joins us live tonight from Pyeongchang. Mike? Hey guys, I'm live in the mountains right now, but in a matter of moments, I could be down on the beach. You're probably thinking, all right, Hedrick, why in the world would you want to go to the beach? It's the middle of the winter, it's windy, it's cold, it's snowing out here. Bottom line is this, the beach will always be the beach. Once in a while, there's a story out there. Before the rest of the world even wakes up. It's not about crime or justice. It's not about politics. In fact, for many, it's likely not even a story at all. But it happens every morning of every day in every corner of the globe. Just not necessarily like... This was the best place to uh, see the sunrise. Yeah, like this. On the coast of Korea, looking out to the East Sea, the universe will grant you a few short moments, not just to take it in, but maybe to remind us. You can't see the sun right now. Just how short life's moments are. Travis Warner is taking full advantage of those moments with Ian, his eight-year-old son. They're here for the winter games. This is my 12th Olympics. And uh, we'll experience from, moments uh, likely never to be forgotten. We were initially going to watch it from the top peak up here, but then we saw this incredible see-through glass floor, so we had to be out here for the experience this morning. And they weren't alone, as others also stepped off this massive cruise ship, 541 feet long, 148 feet tall, getting a chance to take five, look at the artwork, maybe spend some time on the beach. And if they didn't know it already, it's while walking along the waves and the sand. Just seeing the ocean is kind of a cool thing for a lot of folks. That simply looking up may catch you off guard. Because what you are seeing is not photoshopped. Yes, it is a boat. Yes, it's on the side of a cliff. And yes, it's just incredible. It is both awesome and strange. And much like that sunrise for Ian and his father, it will likely become a moment never to be forgotten. How cool is that boat, guys, huh? It was amazing when we saw that thing for the very first time. And here's the great thing about it, okay? First off, as you stay in there, you will not be getting seasick. That's one of the beauties of it. The second thing is you will never have a Titanic moment where you think this thing could sink. Perfectly safe up there on the side of the cliff in the boat. Back to you. <laughs> Ready to set sail in the clouds. Mike Hedrick, live in Pyeongchang. Awesome job, Mike. We'll see you back here next week. Dini? Let's get a couple more down over here. It is the biggest flag yeah, this will work. that has ever flown independently. All right, now. This morning, we laid the flag there out. Again. Whoa. Whoa. Folded it with respect. Whoa. Whoa. It's 150 feet by 78 feet. Whoa. Reach. To actually see how big the flag really is in person is just amazing. That'll work. We had approximately 125 people here. All right, you ready to walk? And it was a testament to the, the type of 
people that are in the city that uh, loved Brent Taylor. Brent would have want this flag flown for more than just him. He was that kind of man. So we're flying this for everybody who's ever served our country. Thank you for being here and honoring Brent and those who served us. Brent was super humble. He wouldn't want this flag flying just for him. So we found it appropriate to do it on Veterans Day. Love you guys. You guys are the best. This is awesome. The motivation is just in the love for the country and the love for the family. Just to do one little thing that I can to help out and to honor Mayor Taylor and all the veterans. <laughs> Brent loved the flag. You know, he was a patriot. That was just a part of who he was, so. Go ahead, you guys, you're good in front, keep going. They were up here yesterday, down and up and down this lane. It made me nervous. I bet. <laughs> Brent was the type of person that really impacted the whole city. Some people say oh, he's just another serviceman, but for us, he was way more than that. It's starting. Yeah! There it goes, there it goes. Oh, man. <laughs> That is, so that is awesome. Indescribable. Fly for every veteran that's ever done anything for our country. Pay honor to Brent and his family. We want them to know that we love them. I can't take my eyes off of it. It's beautiful. It's been an amazing experience to see the community come together. The community is the way it is because we rallied around our leader. That was Brent. Well, some dogs chase sticks. Some dogs catch frisbees. Well, we're about to show you a dog who does something a little different. Yeah, and as photojournalist <laughs> Peter Rosen reports, it's poetry in motion. Austin works. My name is Austin Namba. I paint signs, all hand-painted signs. And Tofu yeah. waits. Good boy. He comes with me everywhere I go. And waits. He waits and waits and waits. Waits for me to get done with my work. A sign of real devotion. He's like my everything best friend. He, he does everything with me. Get your board. This. Get it. Get it. Is what Tofu's waiting for. To set his wheels in motion. Tofu got an early start. Yeah, when he was like 11 weeks old, we gave him a skateboard and kind of got right on it. What? Dude, he's insane. Skate park cool. He'll drop in the bowl. Crazy stuff. He'll kind of watch me do it. Sometimes he follows kind of what I do. Poster dog for love and life. He just loves to have fun. That's like he lives to have fun. 55 pounds of heart and drool. He doesn't pay attention to dogs. He doesn't pay attention to anything. It's like, if you pull out the skateboard, he's just, that's the only thing he sees is a skateboard. Oh, barely missed you. <laughs> I don't know even how to explain it. He's like the most Christ-like dog I've ever seen because he just loves people. He loves life. He kind of teaches me how to be like, <laughs> stoked to be alive because it doesn't take much to just make him happy. There's the dog that heals and stays. He just looks at me. If he doesn't get to skate for like two days, he just gives me this dirty look like, what are you, what are you doing? And then there's the real go-getter. He kind of gives you a, a sense of what life's really about. 
Man's best friend is pretty good. Come on. But best friends on wheels are even better. Peter Rosen, KSL 5 News. Tonight at 10, the untold story in the Susan Powell case. After three years of extensive investigation, KSL reveals never before seen video and interviews. Plus, the push to bring the Olympics back to Utah. The rare meeting happening tomorrow with both Utah and Olympic leaders. But first, the search for a dog killer. One family's warning after their pet was killed in their own backyard. KSL News starts now. Good evening. Tonight, Utah County deputies are looking for help finding whoever shot and killed a dog in a family's backyard. Yeah, this is the second unsolved shooting death of a dog in Eagle Mountain in the past seven months. While police continue to investigate, news specialist Caitlin Burchill spoke to the latest victim's family. Caitlin? The Utah County Sheriff's Office tells me both these shootings happen near each other north of Highway 73 in Eagle Mountain. And while at this point they don't know if they're related, as you can imagine, the family I spoke to is in shock. This doggy licks me. It does. Dogs are part of the Lob family. Aww. <laughs> On this especially dark night. Yeah, I found her back here by this tree. It's obvious they're missing. A family member. I like Roxy. Leanne's a lob found five-year-old Roxy dead Sunday afternoon. She was a great dog. We took her camping with us. My kids loved her. The Australian Shepherd shot dead in their own backyard near Autumn and Elk Ridge Drives. Everybody has dogs over here. I don't, I'm still shocked at why it even happened. I have no idea. Utah County deputies say Roxy was fenced in. Roxy's partner, Red, and their puppies were not injured. And I don't know if somebody was just messing around and they happened and she just happened to catch a bullet or what. They were thinking maybe a BB gun or a pellet gun. Now the Lob family is looking for answers. Who did this to their loved one? Something come forward that we can find out who did this because it's a scary thing to think of somebody coming around just shooting into people's yards whether it's a dog, an animal, or a child. Now, the Utah County Sheriff's deputies are asking anyone, if you have any information or if you might have security footage of the area, to give them a call. Call their Eagle Mountain office or the Utah Valley Dispatch phone number. Back to you. Yeah, it's a shame. Hopefully they can find whoever did this. Caitlin, thank you. And as we mentioned, this is the second time in the past year a dog has been shot and killed in Eagle Mountain. Back in April, a family found their Pomeranian dead in their neighbor's yard. Police are still looking for whoever's responsible and believe the gun used was a 22 rifle or a pellet gun. The Humane Society is also offering a $5,000 reward for any information that leads to an arrest. New at 10, the only survivor of an industrial accident at a mine near Moab has died. The San Juan County Sheriff confirms Arthur Seacrest died of his injuries today. He was one of three workers who were electrocuted at the Intrepid Potash last weekend. The other two men, Russell Helquist and Matthew Johnson, died at the scene. Wildfires continue to burn out of control in both northern and southern California. Right now, dozens of Utah firefighters are on southern California lines helping with the Woolsey Fire. Several crews are fighting on the fire lines. Other Utah teams are waiting to jump in to replace tired firefighters who've been working nonstop. The crews tell us they are ready at a moment's notice. The fires are now blamed for the deaths of 50 people, and that figure could rise as recovery search crews look for the dozens of people still missing. In Southern California, Santa Ana winds continue fueling the Woolsey fire. So far, that fire has destroyed more than 430 structures. Hundreds of residents who'd just been allowed to return home were forced to turn around and flee again after a large flare-up south of Thousand Oaks. In Northern California, the horror stories of people escaping the campfire flames are still fresh. One woman says she thought she and her daughter were going to die in their car surrounded by flames. I kept praying, Lord Jesus, keep me safe, keep my car running, keep us going, get us out of here. They made it. Dozens of others, though, did not. 
Mobile DNA labs are now working in Northern California to identify remains found in burned out cars and homes. Kevin, join us right now. Earlier we were reporting on some of the winds could be almost like hurricane force winds that are going through there. Yeah, you're dealing with not only the Santa Ana winds, but because of the canyon locations and the intensity that comes through there, they do have wind gusts of 60, 70, 75 miles an hour, which do elevate you into that hurricane status. This is the current w temperature on the color plot, and then you can see the wind vanes that are actually the streamlines. What's happening is the high pressure's off the California coast. So now, yesterday the winds were straight north to south over California. Now they're starting to curve around that high and come back out of the east to west. That orientation is what really accelerates the winds through the Santa Ana area as well as, or the, through the mountain areas, and it creates that intensity of the Santa Ana wind effect. Let me show you our time lapse today in Utah. We had some hazy conditions. We've got about moderate to unhealthy air quality for some. And as those clouds were out there tonight, temperatures not quite as cold as they were in the last night. As you look around the West, our overall temperatures are still in the 30s and 40s, 20s off to the east. So how cold is it going to be for the rest of the week? And do we have any storms coming? Your forecast is straight ahead. All right, Kevin, thanks. And fire crews say the threat of the wildfires is far from over. Stay with KSL as we continue to follow the fight to get them under control and the stories from our Utah fire crews helping in that fight. Tonight, we are learning more about services planned for Major Brent Taylor after his body is brought back to Utah tomorrow. Major Taylor, who was also the mayor of North Ogden, was killed while serving in Afghanistan. His body is expected to arrive at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon at the Roland R. Wright Air National Guard Base. Then on Friday, an open to the public viewing is scheduled from 5 o'clock until 8 in the evening at the D Events Center. Then the funeral will take place Saturday at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, also at the D Events Center. Major Taylor will be buried afterwards at the Ben Loman Cemetery in North Ogden. We're going to have live coverage right here on KSL 5, on the KSL 5 Facebook page, and on our KSL TV app. The mother of University of Utah student Lauren McCluskey wants charges against the person who lent her daughter's killer the gun. Lauren's mother tweeted today that she wants that friend held responsible. McCluskey was shot and killed on campus last month. Police say Melvin Rowland borrowed the gun he used to shoot her from a friend. They say he lied to that friend, asking to borrow the gun because his girlfriend wanted to learn how to shoot. Roland is a convicted felon who couldn't own or buy a gun. As of tonight, there have been no charges filed in this case. Salt Lake County Mayor Ben McAdams in Washington tonight preparing for the orientation for new representatives. This comes as the race for Utah's 4th Congressional District is still too close to call. The results of tens of thousands of ballots were released today, and now there is less than one percentage point between McAdams and incumbent Mia Love. Look at that. Only about 1,200 votes separating these two. And today, we got to look inside the processing room where ballots are checked by machine and a person. Utah County plans to release more results on Friday. Now, they still have 27,000 outstanding ballots. In Salt Lake County, they could have as many as 50,000 still waiting to be counted. Well, a big, big day tomorrow as members of the U.S. Olympic Committee visit Salt Lake as part of their process for selecting an American City bid for a future Winter Games. And new specialist Ashley Moser joins us live from Utah's Olympic Oval with a preview tonight. Ashley? Well, Mike and Dini, likely little sleep tonight for Utah's Olympic Exploratory Committee. They are the ones hosting that five-person USOC team tomorrow, and they say it's going to be a very busy day with site visits to at least 10 places here in the state, including here at the Olympic Oval in Kearns. They are also heading up to Park City, so a lot of driving going around um, to check out the bobsled, the luge, also the skeleton track there, and the ski jumps. And the big goal here is to see if our facility are up to par for a future winter games. Now, important to note that these facilities have actually been in use since the O2 games, and that, of course, helps out with our bid. It also helps bring down the cost to host games. The Exploratory Committee set the overall price to host, host future games at just over $1.35 billion. Also on the agenda for tomorrow, a midday luncheon with Governor Herbert and Salt Lake City Mayor Jackie Biskupski. That's planned at the University of Utah's Rice-Eccles Stadium. That's the site of the opening and closing ceremonies, which coincidentally, we learned today that it announced the stadium is getting an upgrade. So we were wondering, does this help with the bid? Certainly, and that's another example during the visit tomorrow of the investment being made into an Olympic venue.
Opening and closing ceremonies were there. We're looking at an $80 million bond. We're looking at uh, having more seating there, which is great for Olympics. Yeah, they plan to add 5,200 more seats. That was approved today by the University of Utah Board of Trustees. But it wasn't because of the bid. They just say it's a coincidence here. But likely uh, it doesn't hurt in that bid, as uh, Jeff Robbins was saying right there. So earlier this week, Reno Tahoe actually dropped out of the running, which only leaves Denver and Salt Lake City for a future Winter Games here in the U.S. The U.S. Olympic Committee says they will make their decision hopefully by the end of the year. So we'll have to see. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, I'm liking our chances with this. 50-50, right? Right. All right. <laughs> Ashley. Hey, Denver, drop out. Just yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Ashley. <laughs> After three years of extensive investigation, KSL reveals never-before-seen video and interviews. I'm just like, this is not gonna end well. Cold, Susan Powell Case Files, The Untold Story, coming up next. It was three years ago tonight that Susan Powell was last seen. In the years since Susan Powell disappeared, hundreds of tips, interviews, and searches have come up empty. There's been no sign of the mother of two since 2009, but her story has stayed in the headlines. Developing news tonight in the case of Susan Cox Powell. It's been eight years since she went She's been the subject of news reports, documentaries, and endless speculation about what really happened. A lot of people just want to know, you know, what you know about her disappearance. Can you tell us? After years in the spotlight and under the microscope of police, her husband, Josh, took his secrets to the grave, along with their two children. But there were some secrets he left behind. Tonight, KSL cracks open the secret Susan Powell case files. And what we're about to show you is only the beginning here. Investigative reporter Dave Colley has spent the last three years painstakingly chronicling all the evidence detectives had in this confounding case for a riveting serial podcast, and we're calling this cold. Yeah, this has certainly been a laborious and eye-opening journey. These new secrets in the Susan Powell uh, saga giving us new unparalleled insight into one of Utah's biggest and most disturbing mysteries. Dozens of files, tens of thousands of documents, journals, and letters, tape after tape of home videos, and Josh's own eerie audio journals. Susan makes me want to live better so that we can love each other and stay together forever. Combined, they are the tangible testimony to years of arduous detective work aimed at finding a woman who simply vanished. Hey, Susan, I'm just uh, worried about Jen. But in sorting through all the old evidence, we discovered brand new revelations, including Josh's minute-by-minute -minute movements in the first days after Susan's disappearance, and new details about that mysterious drive in a rental car. He put like 800 miles on that rental car. He was driving to meet Michael somewhere between here and Washington. Anyway, I just wanted to get you in that dress. That's uh... The shocking true extent of Steve Powell's obsession and even stalking of his daughter-in-law. I started massaging her legs. I would have loved to go all the way up her legs. And I... then, hidden in Josh's journals... I don't have to worry about whether or not I will get hurt. We found a woman not even police knew existed until we told them. What was it like living with Josh? This um, is Catherine Everett. When we first moved there. Josh's first and only other serious girlfriend. He was always the ultimate winner. Catherine may have the most insight into who he really was and what he was capable of. At the time, of course, I thought I was happy. In digging deeper into Catherine's life with Josh and his marriage to Susan, some startling similarities emerged. Josh met both women at local church events. The first time I met him was an activity. No coincidence, says Susan's father, Chuck Cox. No, I, I definitely felt like he was shopping in LDS areas for young girls who believed in the happy marriage and listened to your husband. He didn't want me to have any friends. He only wanted me to have him. Josh controlled with isolation. He needed a cell phone. She didn't need one. And in both relationships, he managed the money. Every time I got my check, he'd have me sign it, and then he'd stick it in his account. She was working because he wouldn't work. In that way, she was basically just a, an asset or a slave. I was an asset to him. But Catherine Everett got away. It's actually kind of creepy. He really kept me on a short leash, and I didn't even realize that that's what was going on. And neither did Susan. Yeah, she was eternally optimistic. 
In first-time interviews for Cold, detectives detailed dead ends and turning points in the investigation. Yeah, that opened the door for us. And the one thing they believe would have forced Josh to reveal what really happened. Josh Powell, of course, was never arrested in his wife's disappearance or her presumed murder. But for years, it seemed police were just one piece of evidence away, and Josh was somehow just one step ahead. I think his guilty conscience was slowly eaten away at him. Three years, thousands of files, more than two dozen new interviews. The evidence, his story, spotlight right on one guy. Cold examines the Susan Powell story you have not heard, starting with the woman who got away, only to see her ex-boyfriend's face on the TV 10 years later. Are you sure it's really him? And I'm like, yeah, it's really him. <laughs> this is not going to end well. Knowing the way that he was, ultimately, I think we all know that was the case. Catherine has never spoken about her relationship with uh, Josh to anyone outside of her family before now. And she wasn't alone. I've talked to a dozen people who were finally ready to break their silence. We've looked through the evidence and even conducted our own tests to try and determine what one key piece of evidence still unidentifiable to the FBI could have been. And I explore the one question besides where is Susan that the world wanted answered. Why wasn't any of this ever enough to arrest Josh? And Dave, there is so much information here. How did you get your hands on all of this evidence? Yeah, I mean, this was certainly a, a, a process that took years, new uh, requests, document requests. Uh, we traveled from Utah to Washington and back to try to track down uh, evidence that had been lost or, or uh, set aside, mislaid, and it's all coming out now for the first time. All right, very interesting. You spent years working on this, and I can't wait to check out the podcast. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And it is a Susan Powell story none of us have heard, and we are giving you early access to our new Cold Podcast series, Episode 1, originally due out tomorrow, is available right now on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. Take a look at Chopper 5 today, flying over the valley here along the Wasatch Front. Our temperatures were on the cool side and snow, it's up in the mountains, although limited, but it's enough to actually get things opened up on some ski resorts. I'll have some info on that in just a minute. Each uh, weekly, on our usually on Monday night, we announce our weekly winner. Well, this week it's Tuesday because of the holiday yesterday. Weston Shuri, your shot of Park City with that snow over the weekend. Congratulations. You're our second weekly winner for the month of November. You've won a framed print. Compliments of Les Olson. You're featured right now at KSL.com. With the viewers, you'll have a chance to vote at the end of the month. Just a reminder, our 2019 calendars, they're in Deseret Bookstores right now. You can pick them up. All proceeds benefit Primary Children's Hospital. We hope you'll continue to support this great cause. Some stunning pictures in this year's calendar. So thanks to all the phot photographers who've made that happen. Two resorts coming online Thursday and Friday. Brighton will open first. Brian Head running second. Park City not far behind. They're scheduled for the 21st. Snow Basin as well. Now all of these on the lower side of the list are conditions pending. But Brighton and Brian Head, they're going for it. And they're going to open up. It's going to be, uh, they've got the runs open, not all the runs, but some of the runs open for limited use and should be a great way to kick off the 2018-19 season. It's 29 in Ogden, 33 in Salt Lake, and 26 in Provo. A little bit of cloud cover filtering in from the west. Now, it's not going to last long. In fact, it's really already falling apart. As it gets to Utah, it just kind of wafts into little pieces. But what will happen over the next 24 hours is there is a big area of high pressure still sitting off the coast. This batch of clouds will continue to work its way east and kind of dissipate. We'll still see plenty of sunshine tomorrow, but that high pressure is starting to slide a little bit farther south. What that's going to do is open the door for a storm system to creep in here by Friday, Saturday. It's not a direct hit on Utah. It'll brush by, but it will give us a chance for a little bit of precipitation, especially in our mountains. And there was a little sun dog out there today, so the odds are trending up. As you see through Thursday and even into early Friday, mostly sunny conditions, it's Friday night into Saturday that I think we'll see those clouds increase here in northern Utah as that little storm brushes on by. In the meantime, teens and 20s overnight, lots of sunshine. Highs will be in the 40s and 50s across eastern Utah. Moving over to western Utah, 64 in St. George, 53 in Beaver, and 50 degrees in Fillmore, 49 in Ephraim. Seven-day forecast, our temperatures continue to go in the mid-60s right on through Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And then we start to drop low 60s rolling out Monday and Tuesday of next week. I still think there's a storm trying to come together for right before Thanksgiving. So stay tuned for that.
20s tonight in Ogden and Salt Lake. Highs in the upper 40s and low 50s. Mostly sunny conditions tomorrow. Seven-day forecast doesn't really take us too warm. We'll peak at 54 on Friday ahead of that little brush-by storm. And then we're dropping back into the 40s for Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. All right. Looks good. Looks promising. We'll it's hope. promising. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. All right. JJ coming up next with sports. The latest college football playoff rankings were released Tuesday night. And for the first time ever, two Utah schools make the top 25 together. The 9-1 Utah and State Aggies. Oh. Here we go. 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, Darwin Thompson. Yeah, the Aggies are in. They make their debut in the rankings at number 23. Their second highest ranked group of five school behind number 11, UCF. The Utes. How about the Utes? The snap back pedals. Fires inside. Incomplete. Incomplete. Jalen Johnson broke it up. That's right. Utah back in the college football playoff rankings. They're number 19 after their win over Oregon. We'll be with the Utes and Aggies in Colorado on Saturday as both teams push toward a conference title. College Hoops, BYU hosting Northwestern State. The Demons from Natchitoches, Louisiana. Yoli Childs dunks in two of his 18 points. He also had 15 rebounds, two blocks, and a steal, and three assists. This one to freshman Connor Harding, who had 11 points off the bench. And Dalton Nixon had 15 points on five of nine, shooting the Cougars. Cast the Demons out of the Marriott Center, 82 to 57. Utah State hosting Mississippi Valley State. Former Brighton Bengal Brock Miller lighting up the Delta Devils, knocks down the three. In the closing seconds of the half, Miller beats the buzzer. He went 6 of 11 from 3, led all scores with 26. But the highlight of the game belonged to John Knight, a new face with the Aggies. He's from Jackson, Mississippi, throwing one down. Sam Merrill added 18, and the Aggies win big tonight. All right, for Ricky Rubio, the fight against cancer is personal. His mother passed away in May of 2016 after a four-year battle with lung cancer. She was just 56 years old. He turned the most painful moment of his life in a motivation to make a difference for others battling the disease. It was so painful seeing her going through all the stuff that it drive me to really help all the people who's going through that. Ricky has found answers at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. He recently visited patients, surprising them with jazz tickets and apparel. All right, I, brought, I brought tickets for a game tomorrow. It's, it's not easy. Uh, there's sometimes that uh, why I have to go to the hospital and, and bring back bad memories. But uh, at the end of the day, when I go back home and uh, I remember all the patients that I can help and uh, uh, families that can go to a game and have a little fun while going through a tough process, it f fills me up. <laughs> One of the promises that I made to my mom was I'm going to try to fight that disease and try to bring more awareness about that type of cancer so they can get it quicker and it's easier to treat. There's a small cell lung cancer and a non-small cell lung cancer. He also spent time with doctors, nurses and researchers supporting the work they are doing to find a cure. After seeing all the research and, and all the work the, doc the doctors put in, it's amazing. The real heroes are, are them. They saving life. You see when you actually going through all the process, you see how, how a doctor is a hero. Ricky's mother never <laughs> smoked. She had a healthy lifestyle and she still got lung cancer. There's a lung cancer that's not caused by smoking. Right. So you learn all these things, he's learned these things, and they're doing some amazing stuff up at the Humpson Cancer Institute with research, and there's some breakthroughs, so there's a lot of positive news up there. Well, it's fun to see that side of jazz members. Yeah, I so. love it. Thanks. We don't always see the great things they're right. doing, and they're doing some great stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right, real quickly here, we just want to let you know, if you are having a hard time finding the cold podcast series on iTunes or Google Play, you can go to ksltv.com and download it directly from there. We'll be right back. Going to download cold for the ride home yep. tonight. Check it out. Thanks for watching tonight. Have a good night.